I will uh, only focus on um, CNS anomalies in fetal congenital heart defects because uh, 30 minutes is actually not enough to cover both topics. And uh, I think uh, I will share with you some evidence in terms of why we are now interested in this aspect because I think the heart and the brain are really closely related. And therefore, um, uh, when it comes to counseling, uh, prospective parents with fetuses affected by congenital heart defects, I mean, now there's been a, a change in the direction of counseling. We started talking about neurodevelopmental delay, etc. But I wonder whether we are there yet, whether we have actually jumped ahead of time. And, and certainly, I, I think we need to have better evidence to guide the counseling. So uh, before I start, uh, I know some of you have joined our uh, diploma in uh, fetal therapy. Just want to let you know that this year we're launching uh, a part-time program on uh, a master in maternal fetal medicine and, and hopefully you'll be interested to join us in, in Hong Kong and various places because I don't think we're going to find a program in Hong Kong, but uh, it's a part-time program and we need four times a year. So anyway, we'll move forward. Um, so in this talk, I'll cover three aspects, and there were already two questions from this morning session. Uh, obviously, we'll touch on CMS abnormalities, we'll touch on corpuscularism development, as well as cerebral hemodynamics. In a, in a nutshell, I, I worry that there might be too much information. Uh, yesterday, I showed one grade in my talk, and they were like, oh my god, it's too much information. So hopefully, it's not too overwhelming. So this is, a, this is some sort of a taster. Why is it a, a concern? Because we know that uh, infants, children with congenital heart defects, they have long-term behavioral problems. They have internalizing problems, they have externalizing problems, they have social problems, social behavioral problems, social involvement, school performance. So the question is, does it happen? Does the damage to the brain happen in utero? Or is it after birth? Or is it around our operation? Is it something that has happened during the operation? Uh, is it something that happens after operation? There are many questions. No one can answer. And of course, in the heart of it, I think genetics feature heavily. In the old days, I'm sure you remember that congenital heart defects have not really been associated with many uh, genetic conditions. But that was back in the old days when we were only exposed to the use of conventional carotid. But now we have access to chromosome molecular array analysis, we have access to molecular sequencing, whole genome sequencing. Are we going to unravel the genetics that contribute to congenital heart defects, perhaps? And then how much genetics feature within this also is a big question. The heart, the genetics, and the brain. I think the three things form a very closely, very closely related uh, uh, prism, uh, and, and we need to really unravel this step by step. So when it comes to known long-term neurodevelopmental concerns, uh, there have already been publications uh, from years ago. It's not a new concept, by the way, but why does it happen? Why do children born with congenital heart defects have worse long-term neurological outcomes? Is it because of uh, an impact on brain maturation? But what causes altered brain impact, uh, uh, brain maturation? Is it because of uh, altered uh, uh, cerebral blood flow during the period of uh, pregnancy? Or something happens during the par peripartum period? Postpartum, as I mentioned, is it being is it a postpartum period we're not optimizing care uh, or is it related to the surgery? Of course it's multifactorial, but then what comes into the picture is, is a big question mark. Cumulative impact, perhaps. Genetics, very important. And then the, how do they all them together? I ask big questions because this is when I, when I saw a paper by, uh, by the Georgia's group and I was like, oh, but having met these results are not helpful. We need to unpack this black box. So I've shown this earlier already. There is a timetable to human brain development, especially in utero and two years after delivery. So I will uh, just skip this. But the most important thing is that there have also been publications some years ago, about 10 years ago, um, in relation to the prevalence and spectrum of in utero structural brain abnormalities in fetuses with complex congenital heart disease. It seems that uh, fetuses with congenital heart disease, they have a much higher chance of uh, having concurrent brain abnormalities in a fifth of the cases. Okay, and the top 
conditions that are associated with brain abnormalities are hypoplastic left heart syndrome, transposition of the great arteries, double outlet right ventricle, to charge and follow, ADSD, and the rest obviously are also relevant, but certainly these top five are for us to remember. Think about why these conditions are associated with a high risk of uh, brain concerns, brain abnormalities, and I think we'll touch on that shortly later. So I was actually referring to, to this paper published uh, in 2016. When this was published, I was still in London. I was a bit baffled by this meta-analysis. May I remind you all, the original use of meta-analysis is to meta-analyze well-designed randomized controlled trials of interventions, not for observational studies. May I remind you all of you, I know you would be like, this is meta-analysis, we must treat this as if this is viable. Not true. Because when you make analyze data, you need to look into the quality of the individual papers. Maybe it's absolutely not worth doing a meta-analysis, and I'll show you some of the comments. And then, but then nonetheless, this paper started this whole discussion. How does the heart contribute to brain development, or maybe the other way around? Certainly, out of this meta-analysis, there were 20 studies, including over 1,000 fetuses with congenital heart defects, three studies focusing on structural abnormalities, seven studies focused on alt brain volume, three studies on metabolism, 14 studies on blood flow. So, the idea of blood flow is of the brain and then congenital heart defects, I think this is not something new. And what we have seen here is that the uh, chance of having structural brain abnormalities uh, uh, in cases with known CHD, about 30%, a third of the cases. So this is fact one. When you see a congenital heart defect during a morphology scan, you must proceed with brain scan. Not just a standard second trimester morphology scan, brain scan. I'm talking about a full neurosomology, as you uh, have seen from our previous presentation, that this is our recommendation to do a full brain scan in fetuses with congenital heart defect. Also, this meta-analysis, uh, meta um, the comments were that studies were not possible owing to the clinical heterogeneity and lack of a consistent method of reporting the data quantitatively. So this, these studies focus on brain volume. All, all of them were case control design. When you do meta-analysis of observational studies, you need to consider prospective core studies not case control design, because case, case control design will then magnify the effect. And then and also um, uh, quite a mixture of different types of congenital heart defect. It's difficult to draw a conclusion if they have a mixed viable conditions. Che uh, when it comes to brain metabolism, all three studies were showing significantly altered brain metabolism and oxygen saturation in fetuses with congenital heart defect, but I think many, very few of us are looking into brain metabolism. But brain blood flow is very durable. However, it was not possible to pool data. They then demonstrated that the zero um, um, placental ratio, which is a CPR, yeah, MCA to the uh, uh, um, artery Doppler was low in fetuses with congenital heart defect when compared to controls in more than half the studies. But nonetheless, they were unable to pool data because of all the, all the reasons I've shown you. Clinical heterogeneity and the lack of consistent method of reporting the data. So, anyhow, structurally, yeah, a few, uh, 30% of the cases, but actually most of them were electrical negative. So we wonder, uh, uh, so how do we take this forward? Am I going to counsel prospective parents that when the fetus, when the fetus has congestive heart defect, there's increased risk of CNS abnormalities. Are we there to do this kind of counseling? For me, I think it is one step too far because I think if you tell the parents that there's a heart problem, that can be treated surgically, that's fine, they can accept it. But when you start talking about the brain, honestly, they will all freak out because you can't do an operation to fix the brain. So therefore, counseling on this basis must be very, very cautious. We mustn't increase the number of cases going for termination of pregnancy by data generated by that analysis. So just a word of caution. I'm not sure whether this is a practice here, but certainly back in 2016, 
2016, we started introducing the idea of brain concern in cases with congenital heart defect, and I was uncomfortable. Nonetheless, we don't have enough data. Just to just give you an example, um, uh, uh, this is a study um, looking at fetal brain MR in fetuses with um, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, and then uh, you can see that there's been a drop off in global brain volume by MR during the third trimester in fetuses with hypoplastic left heart, also a reduction in cortical volume during carefully cortical surface area and white matter volume. All sound very worrying. Smaller brain, not just. Okay, so that all is important for us to measure head circumference because when you have a small head, microcephaly is already too late. Because this is the last thing I will present to, to you is, is if you want to catch it before you have had your uh, microcephaly. And then in relation to uh, uh, cortical volume, again, uh, we, we, we see that uh, fetuses will have plasma heart syndrome, uh, and then there is impact on the cortical volume. But this is obviously primarily a very profound. Uh, uh, structural con condition whereby even doing the operation may not be able to fix the problem. So I think when it comes to have that, that, uh, have passing that heart syndrome, um, maybe it's less of a worry to think of think about the brain. But this is an example to illustrate the relationship between the heart and the brain. But what about more subtle conditions? So in relation to the heart and the brain development, these are the risk factors we need to think about. We've already started looking into them. And, and then intrinsically, genetics is the core. But we've not really had good uh, diagnostic uh, procedures, uh, but now we have all some sequencing and so forth. And so hopefully with more data coming forward, then we will have an answer to this. Pre-operative, meaning during the pregnancy, in utero, how does the heart contribute, heart abnormality contribute to cerebral blood flow? Is there increased cerebrovascular resistance how about environmental exposures that actually contributed to the heart abnormalities to start with? And how does it impact on the fetal brain development? Perioperative, I think we need to work with the cardiothoracic surgeon as well as anesthetist to understand, record all the parameters about anesthetic exposure. Also, whether there's been major fluctuation in the hemodynamics during the operation, how does it damage or impact on the brain development? Nobody knows. Because from the cardiothoracic surgeon perspective, they're just there to fix the problem. They will just operate and correct the abnormalities. They don't think about what that procedure can potentially uh, um, uh, cause on the brain development. But now they're starting to think. Oxygenation, reoxygenation, hypoxia, hypotension, inflammation during the operation, hypothermia, embolism. These are all factors that can contribute to the, to the development of the brain. And obviously, post-op. Obviously, there can be major fluctuations in, in, in uh, oxygenation leading to hypoxia. Well, unfortunately, social economic status plays a major role in length of stay, low cardiac output. So, even though you know, like heart has been operated on, maybe this baby needs multiple stages of operation. And how does that impact on the neurodevelopment? Parental stress, perhaps, reoperations, sepsis, infection, seizures, embolism. And the list is profound. But do we ever talk about those? Perhaps not. Anyway, when it comes to CHD and brain abnormalities, are the brain abnormalities present before or after birth? Overall prevalence of structural abnormalities is increased, but to a slightly lower degree than in newborns and infants with CHD before cardiac surgery. They're not so evident, actually, uh, during the uh, pregnancy period. Maybe it's because we're not looking. We're sticking to the very standard transabdominal 2D imaging whereby you're not able to pick up a subtle brain findings. And this might suggest that peripartal events are unlikely to exist because they are featured earlier. Okay. Mechanism for the association between either brain abnormalities and CHD. So far, no difference in brain size and oxygenation between syndromic and non syndromic fetuses. Again, we need more data to support this because traditionally CHD isn't exactly, if it's isolated, we're not referring to the genetic condition so much. And then altered cerebral uh, circulation in neutral, we really need to study more, and then I welcome that question this morning. Uh, really much, uh, really necessary. The brain abnormalities versus different type of CHD, I already showed you. Hypoplastic left heart syndrome, transposition of the brain margins. Etc. Why are they related to CMS development? It's because 
they have the condition of dark or to altered arterial cerebral perfusion. They will contribute to alter, even TGA is corrected that spot, it alters the cerebral arterial perfusion and therefore that impacts on the brain development. And then, well, now we are really embarking on a new journey. How early can the brain abnormalities be detected in fetuses with CHG? I think certainly as early as 20 weeks. We don't need to wait until 32 weeks nowadays. But generative changes in the developing cortex will only be evident in the late future. So this is always going to be our challenge that we have to accept. And hopefully, with more and more being interested in this topic, then we can perhaps consider deliberate uh, developing prognostication markets in the trimester. So I've already touched on the importance of patient neurosynography. Uh, uh, attributes to the work of Izuko and, and I'm very um, uh, lucky that I learned from her. And then uh, what I want us to do is to think about the application of neurosynology, not just for diagnosing analyses, but what information can we draw for prognostication. I think that's important. That's why doing the uh, superficial animal measurements uh, I think would be quite helpful because and then I will show you some data. Um, earlier I didn't show you this image, yes, and, but you can see, uh, I did talk about the, the, the timetable, yes, and then uh, if you refer to the 25 weeks image, this is the interior coronal section of the fetal brain captured by 3D imaging, and you can see that the, the superficial superior portion of this, of the, of, of, of the fishes are horizontal, zero degree, and before 25 weeks, is, you know, the angle is above zero degree. And then, after 25 weeks, then, then you get the internal rotation, whereby the, the angles become negative. So when I look at this image, very easily I can tell that I can create a measurable marker. What well, measurable does not is obviously the motor of Kipros, and then I really live in through this. So in order to capture this, this is a brief, um, uh, uh, mentioning here is that, uh, of course, when you do the uh, image capture, the most important thing is when you do the 2D scan, you need to find this image. Then, then you pray that the fetus isn't going to move for the next three seconds or longer. If you want to get a high quality capture, you need a much longer time. And then, uh, so what I tend to do is I hold onto the fetus with my left hand. And then we do the sweep. And, and then afterwards, the three other model planes are as shown. What we need to remember is to make sure the frontal lobe is pointing down, okay? This will then give you the right side of the brain on the left, and then the left side of the brain on the right. And then making sure that the corpus callosum is horizontal, and this is important before 25 weeks, and after 25 weeks, you need to make sure the maxilla is horizontal. Then, then the 3D dot has to be on the tip of the telocoroidea. And this is basically the exact image that we would ask you to acquire, hopefully this afternoon. And then, then after this, you are very happy with this, and you basically use one screen, which is this one. Then you can measure. And I showed this to you earlier today already. Placing the, the horizontal line anywhere, as long as it's horizontal, you don't, you don't need to place it on a particular landmark. And then the second line should be basically touching the echogenic portion of the superior part of the superficial. Okay, and then, then you can measure this angle and then this angle. And you label this as a positive angle, and you label this as a next angle for beyond 25 weeks. And then uh, based on the work of 200, uh, 422 uncomplicated singleton pregnancies, we have obviously derived uh, these graphs. Uh, what, what I would say is not to use a head circumference as uh, the, the x-axis, you must always use uh, gestational age. Because in the case of microcathy, if you have gone with the head circumference graphs, then you could be uh, reassuring yourself that the seven visual angles development are okay. So we stick with the gestational age uh, as the x-axis, okay? And then, so, just a slogan from, from us, 25, zero degree. You will never forget this, right? <laughs> One ticket message. So um, I'll share with you some data, not many, because uh, during COVID, I started the study, but then uh, because of COVID, therefore, uh, I greatly hindered my research. But nonetheless, I have some data to share with you. Uh, uh, we 
We recruited about 25 cases of uh, congenital heart defects, and we measured superficial angles in all of them, and you can see that um, the uh, solid dots are the cases uh, with uh, CHD with superficial angle close to 90th percentile or above, whereas the open circles are the cases uh, with superficial angles below the 90th percentile. So half of my CHD cases at the trimester uh, here, uh, they were uh, with one or both signs uh, uh, with delay or all one superficial angle development. So, and then, uh, so, so these are the right angle measurements, and these are the left angle measurements, I think. Yes. And then, then we looked into the individual um, conditions. You can see the solid, just focus on the solid uh, circles, PS, pulmonary misnosis, this obviously has an impact on the perfusion, TGA as well. And then, uh, so these are the two uh, conditions that are associated with borderline or delayed superficial angle measurement. And then um, these are the right, right superficial angle measurements. Again, we have the TGA perfusion there, 30%, PS as well. And then uh, here we have about 42% of the cases with borderline or delayed superficial angles measurement. So these are just a quick snapshot of my 25 cases. And then we are embarking on a much bigger project now that I'm enticing my friends and collaborators to join this project so that we can collect more and more uh, data systematically. So this is called code development, superficial angles measurements, and then now we want to toxic fellows in development. So the trouble I have with corpus callosum measurements is so heterogeneous. There are basically 12 studies um, reporting on, on the, uh, the methodology in the measurement of, uh, of the corpus callosum and very variable. So we don't have a uniform methodology, but we have to have a uniform methodology so that we can assess the corpus callosum uh, to define um, a short corpus callosum. So what we are really embarking on, I mean, this is not something I have invented. I've looked into this literature, and we need to understand uh, how the corpus is being divided. Uh, traditionally, there's seven regions. You can see the rostrum, genu, the curve, the rostral body, which is basically the anterior third part. You've got the anterior mid-body, posterior mid-body, isthmus, the tail, and then the splenium. And then uh, we can then refer to different cortical region because, well, you need to be systematic in evaluating the consequences. It sounds horrendous, isn't it? To, to, so I'm again urging all the companies to create uh, easy tools for us to divide the consequences into the different sections. Otherwise, it's a very manual process. So essentially, the rostrum is referring to mid-caudal, or the orbital, prefrontal, and inferior promoter uh, region. Generally, is referring to prefrontal, Rostral body is referred to premotor, supplementary motor. Anterior mid body is referred to motor. And then posterior mid body is uh, somatic, posterior parietal. Then isthmus is referred to superior temporal, posterior parietal. And the splenic is referred to hospital inferior temporal. And you need to really look at the different um, uh, segments, not just the, just the length. And so, I'm not the first one to look into this. This is already published uh, in the White Journal. Uh, uh, the cases with congenital heart defects, and then this study looked into um, Cox callosum biometry. So, there are two classes of CHD. And one class is with reduced arterial oxygen supply to the brain, primarily TGA, severe left outflow obstruction. Type B is mild. Arterial, uh, normal or mildly arterial oxygen supply to brain, class B, PSD, uh, to try to follow severe PS, uh, a truncus arteriosus, double the right ventricle, and then you can see the distribution of cases, and they measure the length, they also measure the total area, and then they then also divided um, the coxcular into seven subdivisions, and the conclusion is very evident here that the corpus total area is reduced in, in the CHD cases, more profound in class A, certainly significant results, and then in relation to the splenium area, that is the tail, I think this also has shown quite profound reduction in the size 
uh, gain more, more, more and pronounced results in class A. So fetuses with major congenital heart defects, they have a small copper sclerosis, and the difference uh, is more, more marked in class A uh, with expected poorer brain oxygenation. So uh, this is uh, a study uh, looking into fetal brain volume as well as actually the size of copper sclerosis in CHD infants by surgery. Again, they've observed reduced brain volumes in infants with CHD, uh, which persist postnatally in neonates prior to surgery, with significant reduction in the isthmus and the splenium of the cox person. So it seems that we are really seeing uh, a lot of data in the prenatal period, pregnancy period, in the immediate postnatal period before surgery. So uh, what we really need to uh, decide on is the contribution of genetics as well. So last is cerebral hemodynamics. I will just briefly touch on that. This is very complex, and I think this is an area that will need a lot of support from uh, the various companies. And, and, um, and this paper looked into 3D power of, uh, of cerebral blood flow diffusion in CHD, and it looked into VI, uh, 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 VFI, and FI as well using STIC. And uh, obviously, it's also uh, looking into the uh, total Volume. And you can see um, there is an increase in cerebral confusion in CHD cases as a compensatory mechanism. And then, uh, and then um, especially for, for heart loss and uh, left uh, side of obstructive lesions affecting uh, arterial uh, cerebral confusion. And, and this is a compensatory mechanism. And then, then, so these are the results also showing that the largest increase is actually in the uh, anterior uh, uh, cerebral artery territory. And there's a positive correlation between total intracranial FI and then PDI and MDI. So these are all just uh, um, uh, postnatal uh, baby scales of infant development. So in my work right now, um, I can't do all by myself. It's a very, very uh, multidisciplinary we ask questions, then we can draw our questions into research programs, and we draw attention from our friends and collaborators, and we can build this program together. And I'm linking up with uh, various centers in mainland China. Uh, we are talking to uh, sonologists, MR specialists, we're talking to neurologists, to, because we can't do this uh, without getting the neurologists involved to do the uh, pediatric neurologists to do the baby. Scales, and then also we're engaging with the clinical plastic surgeons. We also need to engage with the ministers. So, build this project. So, take home messages children born with CHD have worse long term 